Not long ago, this is something that we do not often do. You can't find someone who done it before oftentimes in your uh, group or team. A patient came in with um, presumed anaphylactic shock. Those who know the situation where they get swelling in the throat and um, they struggle to breathe. Um, and eventually their throat close off if we do not treat in timely manner and uh, they can potentially die of it. So we have minutes to decide what to do. And this particular patient was uh, in uh, his 50s, turned up by himself because he had itchy throat. And within minutes, he went into this situation. Taken into recess and at that moment, there wasn't anyone else who could help with this airway. The anesthetist was not able to get the tube down the throat and manage the airway. The patient's oxygen levels were dropping so rapidly and it was a periodic situation. At that moment, I was lucky enough to uh, involve in that research and I managed to uh, get the uh, airway uh, secured by a last resort, mean of last resort, that is we call emergency cricothyroidotomy. So I was the one performed the procedure and patient's life was saved. Two weeks later, patient went home and another week later, the patient came and gave me a hug. <laughs> At that moment, only I knew it was a, it was one of our staff member's parent. And that particular day that he came in, that staff member was on duty as well. Mm. And I didn't uh, think about anything else. Everyone asked me when I walked out after doing the procedure, how old was he? I said, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't see anything else. I saw only the, the prepared neck in front of me. I didn't <laughs> see anything else. Was he blue? Was he pink? I said, I didn't know. I just saw only one thing. I saw the neck. I saw the beautiful <laughs> neck open up. And I saw scalpel lying next to me. Yeah. I saw the tracheo, tracheostomy kit open up next to that. Yeah. That's all I saw in there. <laughs> I did that within two minutes and I walked out and gave the patient back to the team. Yeah. That's all I saw. But that was one of the very satisfying moments, especially when you see that patient went home two weeks later mm. with no single IQ point lost. Mm. I mean, no uh, hypoxic brain injury. Yeah. Yeah. And he's back to work in uh, two months' time or so. It's amazing. So that's, that's on my duty. Another moment I want to uh, take the opportunity to tell what you can do as a human being. During COVID time, mm. It's a global crisis. I was, we were working really hard in our department to make sure that uh, the COVID patients are looked after well, with dignity. We are lucky enough to be the, one of the best health services in the world to have minimum a number of deaths and complications as a whole in Australia. Mm -hmm. It's everybody's contribution. But some countries were not that lucky enough where my birth country, Sri Lanka, was one of them struggling through because of lack of resources. Yes. This is very, very personal experience. I involved in managing the critical care ambulance service in Sri Lanka for two months. Right. So at that time, they were at infancy, the ambulance services, and they had limited number of services available, but demand was so high. Hmm. So they wanted to have a system to manage this more effectively to minimize the burden on normal ambulance services. Right. So they did not have enough expertise at that time. Well, I don't have that expertise anyway, but with the help of one of my friends, we set up the group and managed to establish a system 24 hours to dispatch ambulances for emergencies in Sri Lanka. Wow. This was done online. Right. With uh, the help of uh, Sri Lanka Telecom, mm. they gave us free uh, contact line. Right, right, right. We managed to uh, recruit uh, three teams, four teams globally, Australian Eastern team, Australian Western team, British team, and US team. All our colleagues who we know from our profession, and we had 72 doctors. Most are in critical care, either ICU or anesthesia or emergency medicine. And we covered 24 hour shift, answering all phone calls from ambulances in Sri Lanka, and also the COVID uh, task force uh, message center. Wow. Whenever a patient calls, they link connect the patient to us, and we give instructions over the phone. Wow, so it's and patient to doctor. Patient to doctor. Wow. And uh, we managed to bring down the COVID-related ambulance calls from 1,900 a day mm. to 600. That's huge. 
That's a third cut. Yeah. Jesus. So was brought down to a manageable level and handed over after two months, and they they continued to come, uh, you know, continued that process. That's amazing. The most rewarding thing I felt was after concluding the uh, task, mm. we as a group, we that group is not an organization or anything. We just came up for the task, and mm. then we said, okay, now it's time for us to go apart. And when I emailed everyone, okay, our job is done. We delivered what they expected from us. Now we are handing over that back to Sri Lankan authorities, and it's time for us to have rest. Mm. I received one particular email from a British doctor, which I never knew, mm. and she she wrote a letter that I will never forget. She said, "Right now, I'm typing this letter while I'm in the hospital mm. on a bed," mm. and she said, "I was diagnosed four months ago with breast cancer." I got a couple of more months to live, mm. and you gave me the most beautiful opportunity in my life to be in the hospital bed receiving chemotherapy. I was answering those phone calls from people in Sri Lanka, Jeez. and she said, "I probably have two more months to live." Mm. Thank you very much for giving that opportunity. That's amazing. I don't know even who she is even today. I don't know whether she's alive now or not. But that was one of the most beautiful moments as well, and I felt. Uh, Giving help to my country, my birth country, one thing, but this is probably the most rewarding part of it. Yes. If I made one person's life beautiful through that, I think that's amazing. That's incredible, and we're so lucky in this profession profession to have experiences like that. It's beautiful, and it comes back to that sort of thing I was saying before. How some of these most painful experiences I feel like we have in medicine end up being the the moments that you look back for in years and be like, that was a beautiful moment. That's amazing. How do you think that's that experience has changed your practice now today? It's every day. So it, it's, it's doing that for someone and they're smiling, they're walking out with happiness. Mm. That's the rewarding thing. You don't want a, a bottle of wine or chocolate from them. Mm. That's happiness. Mm. Somebody is comfortable after your treatment. That is the ultimate goal. Yeah. So always, I start my work every shift thinking that I'm I will make someone's life better today. Which one one way or the other, maybe your loved one is passing away, mm. but without suffering. Yeah. Without pain. That's also a beautiful thing. I agree. Absolutely. Medicine is not always curing someone mm. or making them live one more day. No. Sometimes it's about making them comfortable. 